welcome to the world this week. There's no way around it. It was a bloody week all over the world. A wave of stabbings and unrest by Palestinians spreads across Israel and the West Bank. The United States is abandoning Syrian rebels as Russia is stepping up airstrikes in Syria. Nearly 100 people dead in what appears to be a suicide attack on a pro-Kurd rally in Ankara, Turkey. And the latest mass shootings in colleges across America frustrates President Obama. These are some of the issues we'll touch upon this Sunday. With me this Sunday are Tal Shalev of I-24 News. Hi, Tal. And Denny Grossman. Denny served as a fighter pilot both on U.S. and Israeli Air Force. And among other um, projects, he's involved with helping both Israelis and Palestinians to deal uh, with post-trauma stress disorder. Thank you very much for coming, Denny. Uh, I guess you know the skies over uh, Syria quite well, but the problem is on the ground. Uh, is the uh, Obama administration abandoning the Syrian rebels? I wouldn't use the phrase of the Obama administration aban abandoning anybody. Uh, I would say that it's a very complex situation and that the Obama administration has its set of parameters, its set of uh, interests. And uh, one of the things is, of course, fighting the Daesh, ISIL. And uh, in that, there is an overlap with the Russians. America is keenly interested in not getting into an, an, a fight which they'll have to lead, lead to putting boots on the ground, right, fighting but from it, the air. Right, but it looks bad. I mean, the Russians are bombing a few, uh, you know, so, uh, rebels, and then the United States saying, well, you know what, let's forget about it. So now, again, actually to go into who is bombing which targets, and uh, it's very easy and very plain for anyone to see that America and Russia do not have the exact same interests in Syria. Uh, Russia is very keen on uh, keeping a good relationship and keeping Assad in power. Uh, America would very much like to find some way to make that uh, not happen. Let's talk about what's happening uh, on the streets of Israel, on the West Bank. It's, it's a unique wave of violence, of stabbings by young people mostly. Uh, something that uh, has been going on for like uh, 10 days or so. Uh, how is it played internally? Because I know this thing has been covered extensively here on this channel. How is it played internally, politically in Israel? Well, we can talk about a number, actually. Yesterday, there was a poll conducted on Israeli Channel 2 TV that said that 73 percent of the Israeli public are unsatisfied with the way the Israeli prime minister is handling the situation. And Netanyahu is in a very difficult uh, political situation, mainly by by the way, uh, because of pressure from his right wing, from factors inside his own coalition who are um, very discontent with what has been done uh, up until now and are demanding Netanyahu uh, use a much tougher hand. But Netanyahu has been acting in a responsible way, at least in the diplomatic arena, and he has been very restrained, trying to be attentive to the international community and not to have any actions that could further complicate the situation. But he is paying a political price for this. Right. Uh, Denny, beyond what uh, Tal just uh, has said, there are voices in Israel uh, uh, which say uh, there's uh, no uh, strategy uh, to counter this kind of uprising uh, on the part of Israeli government. Again, to counter the uprising, first you have to say what caused the uprising. And what caused the uprising was the level of incitement, if you will, uh, Abbas letting the uh, Alaksa genie out of the bottle or playing the Alaksa card, which stirs up a violent tiger, uh, unleashes a violent tiger out of the, uh, out of that, and now he's trying to ride that bear back to get that down, to, to get that back under control. The Israeli Prime Minister, Netanyahu, I think has been doing an excellent job in trying to restrain the right wing and the calls for uh, very, very harsh measures and trying to uh, call Obama, uh, Abbas and keep him to try to get his forces and his people right, but uh, The opposition to Netanyahu um, uh, says you haven't done much, if anything, uh, to advance the peace process, and this is part of the result. Again, there is a problem with calling what Obama, what uh, pr uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu can actually do in advance of the peace process. He was very clear in the United Nations, even after Abbas's outrageous statement about uh, the Jews and their dirty feet at, on the Temple Mount, and yet he was very, very good in saying, let's get down 
to business. Let's talk, have direct negotiations. Let's stay focused on that. And I think that's very important. Remember, uh, both the right wing and the left wing in Israel is going to try to usurp this from, uh, from uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. I think Prime Minister Netanyahu is doing a good job in trying to get uh, the, uh, the Palestinians to put this down under control and to try to debunk the myth of the the fact that these that the Israelis what they say claim uh, was trying to change the status quo just using numbers for example there were some four million visits by Muslims to the Temple Mount in the last year according to uh, police estimates as opposed to some two hundred thousand Christians and about twelve thousand Jewish visitors to the Temple Mount that just puts things in their proportion and I think uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is trying to say guys let's disincentivize violence, and let's incentivize talking. Tal Shalev and Danny Grossman, thank you very much. What's happening in Turkey? Nearly 100 people were killed in one terrorist attack in Ankara on Saturday. With us from Turkey is freelance journalist Laura Wells. Hello, Laura. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's start with some context, Laura. Uh, what actually happened in Ankara? A group of unions had organized this march, which was called the Labor, Democracy, and Peace March. And it was also trying to draw attention uh, to the current separatist uh, militia, PKK, uh, which is Kurdish against the Turkish army that has been going on for decades, but recently became more inflamed after another terrorist bombing on a group of leftist Kurds in the South on July 20th. Uh, this is actually the deadliest terrorist attack on Turkish soil since the beginning of the Republic in the 1920s. This is a very dark day for almost every Turk. Uh, it's very shocking. Uh, not the fact necessarily that Kurds were targeted because this is the third such attack since June, uh, but that this was such a massive attack. Uh, it, now, in, in the, between t different groups in Turkey, they're pointing figure, fingers at each other. Uh, some of the pro-government groups, uh, which is now ruled by the AK Party, the largest party in Turkey, uh, some are saying that this could have been an inside job uh, by the Kurds to gain sympathy, to win more votes in the November 1st re-election. Uh, then the co-founder of the Kurdish party, HTP, he actually pointed the finger directly at the government and said that they were absolutely responsible for this. There's a lot of conspiracy theories going on. Uh, three ministers, including the interior minister, uh, said that they believe they know who did this uh, and they do not want to talk about it at this time. Uh, but they said because of all the speculation and conspiracy theories on social media, it led them to block Twitter. It is still blocked in Turkey. Uh, also, there is a media ban put in place on reporting about this story. This commonly takes place after terrorist attacks in Turkey. So there's not much more information about what's going on, uh, at least officially, uh, though the prime minister just spoke, uh, and so did the president earlier, and they sent their condolences and condemned these attacks. Right, and some say it was ISIS. We don't know. What does the, the Turkish government uh, say about this officially? They have all roundly condemned this attack, except the forestry and waterworks minister, who said that these were provocateurs in a terrorist uh, demonstration, uh, and that they were trying to gain sympathy uh, for more votes um, in the November 1st election. All other, the justice minister, the interior minister, the prime minister, and the president, they have roundly condemned this. They have not said who was behind them, but they do condemn these attacks. Such a, a large-scale tragedy, could it have any uh, impact on the coming elections? Well, the PKK, uh, the separatist Kurdish militia, had said that they were going to start a unilateral ceasefire this week uh, in preparation for the November 1st election. Uh, that is because the government had tried to move all of the electoral polls away from the local usual locations. They said that they couldn't secure them in the southeast, which are predominantly Kurdish areas. Uh, the electoral board said that that wasn't possible. They had to keep them in place. But some of these areas have been under curfew. Uh, some of them uh, continue to be off and on in an emergency state with heavy police presence uh, and continuing uh, violence. Uh, so 
we just don't know if this ceasefire, which the PKK did say they will affect as of today after these attacks, uh, will hold or not. It was conditional. They said uh, they will not attack Turkish security officials unless attacked. So we don't know what they consider being an attack at this point, since I cannot foresee that the Turkish security officials will stop trying to root out PKK, uh, find them, and uh, take them into custody. Laura Wells in Istanbul, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Nine dead and 20 wounded, that's the casualty count after the mass shooting in Oregon. Since then, we had more college shootings in Arizona and Texas. President Obama is clearly frustrated. It is not normal. It is not inevitable. It doesn't just happen. It is a choice that we make, and it is a choice that we can change. There are ways to protect our children and protect our rights. Don't pretend that there aren't. I-24 News correspondent Daniel Ziri joins us from New York. Hello, Daniel. Hi, Jacob. Well, President Obama uh, challenged the media to compare the number of terrorist victims to those of gun violence in America, and the numbers the numbers are quite amazing. Absolutely, they're quite amazing. Well, first of all, as you said in the beginning, yes, President Obama was very upset after this shooting, and, and you could see that during his statement. And you have to know this is the 15th time that he was making such a statement following a mass shooting, and probably with this, the latest Arizona shooting on a college campus as well, he's going to have to make a, such a statement on gun control for the 16th time. But yes, this time it was a little different. He asked the media to tally the numbers, um, as you said, and compare the victims of terrorism and victims of gun violence. And the numbers are indeed quite amazing, quite shocking. I have to give you those. Uh, they're very, very, um, uh, you know, shocking for a lot of people. From, the, from 2001 to 2013, which is the latest year that we can get data uh, for these gun deaths, uh, well, about four, 400 thousand people died on American soil uh, from gun violence and so these deaths actually include uh, suicides of course homicides but also accidents that happen with households uh, that had gun and guns in them uh, and th those includes uh, also uh, uh, deaths of, uh, of children who were playing with their parents guns uh, for the same period uh, so 2001 to 2013 according to the US State Department uh, the victims of terrorism American victims of terrorism abroad and on US soil were only 3,300 and 80 people. So you see there's a huge, huge gap. And I have to tell you also, Jacob, that this year it looks like the gun deaths are going to surpass car accident deaths in the United States. Well, there's the Second Amendment and the gun lobby and the Republican candidates, many of them say stuff happens. So uh, basically there's a little chance for change, right, for legislation. Yeah, you know, uh, for a lot of people abroad, this issue is a very simple equation. Guns equals bad equals killing people, let's just ban them. Uh, but in the U.S., it's a much more complicated uh, topic than that. It's a, probably one of the most politicized issues in the United States um, ever, uh, you know, actually. It, it, it's, it's been talked about every single time that there is a mass shooting here. Um, the, the debate sort of rises again. And, uh, you know, this Second Amendment that you mentioned, the right to bear arms, uh, gives American people the right to bear arms for their protection. Well, it's something that that, um, is just like freedom of speech here. It's something that people are very, very attached to, and particularly on the Republican side, it's true. Uh, the NRA, the National Rifle Association, is a very, very powerful gun lobby here in the U.S., and the people who advocate for um, the right to bear arms are very, very vocal and powerful and influential here. And uh, some of them even fund campaigns for, uh, ca for Republican uh, uh, candidates that we're seeing right now during the uh, presidential race. And so, and so this is a very important uh, and, and complicated issue. We've heard several of the candidates, Donald Trump, for example, he blamed the Oregon shooting on mental illness and said that the actual problem in America is that we uh, don't have a, a good system to take care of mental illness. Uh, Jeb Bush said the famous phrase, uh, stuff happens. And so uh, for him, uh, really, gun control would not have helped uh, uh, do anything with this, uh, with this shooting and not have helped to prevent it. Uh, on the other side, people like 
like Hillary Clinton on the Democratic side are fighting for gun control and are offering their plans uh, to make more strict regulations in the U.S. So it's a very, very politicized issue, um, and it's something that is not that easy uh, when you think about it here in the U.S. Uh, compared to uh, what, what you might think abroad. Right. Daniel Ziri, I-24 correspondent in New York. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob. And this has been The World This Week. We'll see you here next Sunday. Have a great week.